know the baby shark hand washing song well during the pandemic. After the first couple of weeks of staying at home, our oldest son, who was in kindergarten, started having to check in for Zoom class every morning. Teachers had scrambled to come up with some kind of programming that could work online-ish. And every morning, our son listened while a cartoon baby shark sang cheerfully and so annoyingly about washing hands. Meanwhile, just before everything shut down, I had looked up lyrics to songs that took 20 seconds to sing from Lizzo to Belinda Carlisle and posted them in our bathrooms at church. They're still posted because why not? Every parent, every teacher, every camp counselor knows the ups and downs of helping children to actually wash their hands. Kids go through periods of time when you think they've got it down and then you look at their hands supposedly just washed and you see the dirt on their knuckles and send them back to wash again, this time with soap. And of course, there are so many studies and statistics that show how poor hand washing practices are among adults too. So it's not just about the kids. Of course, hand washing is important. One of the few good things that came out of the pandemic was an awareness that basic hygiene is important for general health. So I have to admit that I'm not really willing to support Jesus in what appears to be an anti-hand washing tirade. Well, except Jesus is not on an anti-hand washing tirade. There's nothing wrong with the act itself of washing hands. What Jesus is preaching against is the performance of doing something good and lawful while failing to actually do the thing that's important. Jesus is not actually speaking against hand washing or even against the law, but there is something wrong with washing hands in a ceremonial way and believing that's all there is to being a better person. Just like there is something wrong with posting performative memes and never showing up in a practical way. For the Pharisees in this particular context, hand washing was a sign of their cleanliness, which in turn meant that they could compare themselves favorably to others who were, by comparison, ritually unclean. They could look at Jesus' disciples and say, I can't trust them because I didn't witness them ceremonially, ceremonially washing their hands. It's not the hand washing that's the problem or even the desire to follow the rules that's the problem. It's the following the rules so diligently that you miss why they exist in the first place. Rather than bringing people together, the Pharisees in this particular story are using their excellent hygiene skills as a way to set themselves apart from others and declare themselves more holy than anyone else, more loved, more chosen, and more worthy. What the Pharisees are doing by washing their hands is useful and good, but they are using it as a means of setting themselves apart from others rather than as a way to include. They are not inviting the disciples to come and join in the cleansing. They are merely pointing at them and declaring them unclean. They are using this ritual to declare them outsiders rather than inviting them in. And surely we've all done it in one way or another. This story gives us an opportunity to think about the things we do that are performable, visible to others, that show we are good people or allow us to feel like we're doing something, while at other points we may also do things that undermine our best intentions to love our neighbors. It's easy enough, for instance, to speak out about injustice online, but are we taking action that leads to change? What are the ways in which we perform our cleanliness, righteousness, and godliness without backing it up with action? What are the ways in which we use performative righteousness as a way to separate ourselves from others? The other major piece of this story is that feeling of uncleanliness on the part of the disciples, because many of us will separate ourselves from our communities because we believe we're not worthy of being part of them. We're insecure about who we are or what we've done or what's happened to us in the past. But Jesus says, there's nothing outside of us that can make us unclean. There's nothing that anyone can do to us that could ruin us or defile us or make us dirty or unworthy in God's eyes. And that is super important. It is what comes out of us that can hurt a community, that can defy ourselves and our neighbors. It's the way we react to the world around us, the way we reflect or stifle the beauty of God's image that is indelibly imprinted on our lives. Anxiety levels are on the upswing in our society, and when we're anxious about something, we often want to fixate on something visible something we believe we can change quickly, or something we can place blame on someone or ourselves for, or we want to simply check out and wall ourselves off. That's easier than dealing with the real problem at hand. 
It's something we all do individually at different points in time, but we are witnessing the destructiveness of that behavior when it all comes out on a collective level. When we are all anxious presences together, it's hard to see a way forward that doesn't descend into unhelpful conflict or despair. Our fears and anxieties divide us from others rather than bringing us together and that it's mutual trust and inclusion that will repair ourselves and our communities is what Jesus is talking about here. We still need to do the things that are visible in part because sometimes it's about being an example. But Jesus is calling us to examine our own lives, looking at the ways we fall short of the glory of God because it's our human nature. When we are able to remember that we will simultaneously do good things and fall short, that we are always, in Luther's words, simultaneously saint and sinner, we have a greater capacity for grace and community building. None of us will ever be perfect. It's impossible. But through God's grace, those whom we encounter can experience God's love as it radiates through us. Amen.